By the end of the Second World War, the place of the sniper in modern warfare had been firmly established. <laughs> sniper fire produced more fear and confusion amongst soldiers on the ground than any other type of fire. Such fear was well founded. The sniper's rifle could kill more men more selectively with less ammunition and less risk of detection than any other weapon. And yet the importance of sniping was not generally recognized at the start of the war. In 1939, the use of snipers was not a new idea. As far back as the American War of Independence, the British had hired crack German marksmen to strengthen their arm. But it was technological development in the late 19th century that enabled the marksman to become the sniper. The introduction of smokeless powder meant a rifle shot was hard to locate. Now, effective concealment was a real possibility. New nickel-coated bullets could be fired at higher velocities, resulting in longer range and greater accuracy of shot. Accuracy at long range was further enhanced by the development of telescopic sights. At the forefront of this advance stood the world-famous German optical industry. By 1914, the Kaiser's army had capitalized on the new technology. In the trenches, Germany made efficient use of soldiers highly trained in the two elements of sniping, marksmanship and field craft. The quality of their telescopic sights made German snipers especially dangerous in the half-light of dawn and dusk. At first, British troops thought they were losing men to random fire. Only gradually did they realize that snipers were responsible. Major H. Hesketh Pritchard tried to rectify the situation by setting up sniping schools behind the front line in France to train Allied snipers. A lifetime of big game hunting had given him experience of using telescopic sighted rifles and of lying in wait for his quarry. German snipers were particularly hard to locate because they were taught to switch between several sniping positions, firing only a few shots from any one before moving on. Hesketh Pritchard tried to counter the German threat by encouraging British snipers to work in pairs, one acting as marksman, while the other scoured possible enemy stakeouts through a powerful telescope. Gradually, the sniping war turned to the advantage of the Allies. Although both German and English armies had appreciated the importance of sniping in the First World War, training did not advance afterwards. A feeling that sniping was only relevant to the static conditions of trench warfare 
that a subsequent war would be fought differently led to apathy in the interwar years. By 1940, the spectacular success of German Blitzkrieg seemed to confirm the obsolescence of sniping to the Wehrmacht. But as British troops were pushed back towards Dunkirk in May, it became important to hold up the German advance for as long as possible. Snipers had some success in pinning German troops to their positions for crucial hours. Dunkirk made the British realize that sniping could still have an important place in a mobile war. The War Office opened a school to train officers and NCOs in sniping techniques at the famous Bisley Range. The course was run by Lovett Scouts, all gillies from the Scottish estate of Lord Lovett. Experience of culling deer on this estate had made the scouts expert stalkers. Their training scheme emphasized the field craft aspect of sniping. The British sniper was issued with the workmanlike, if unremarkable, Lee Enfield .303. The best models were taken from production batches and fitted with three power T-32 telescopic sights. Trainee snipers were encouraged to get within 300 yards of their target before firing. This meant camouflage, stealth, and a keen sense of awareness were at a premium. Snipers were issued with face veils and denison smocks and instructed not to wear the all too distinctive tin helmet. They were taught to conceal reflective materials like the metal on their gun muzzles or the glass on their telescopes. It was also vital to keep ammunition dry, as damp cartridges would produce telltale puffs of smoke when a shot was fired. As in the First World War, snipers were encouraged to work in pairs, one with a 20-power telescope to direct the other's aim. The Lovett scouts tried to foster the classic sniper traits of cool-headedness, caution, self-reliance and meticulous observation. Trainees were taught to crawl as flat as possible so as to avoid casting shadows, and also to crawl slowly enough to avoid attracting attention by startling wildlife. To perfect stalking techniques, some trainees were sent to Caldeer on Lovett's estate, where they spent two weeks living rough. There they were told not to shoot beyond 50 yards to prevent wounding an animal. Countrymen, used to crawling on their stomachs after rabbits and foxes made natural stalkers. Later, in Normandy, streetwise lads from the east end of London, used to living by their wits, would show a similar instinct for stealth. The British had already started to prepare for the day they would return to France. But before they could do so, 
the Wehrmacht would do some rethinking of its own. Unlike its British and German counterparts, the Red Army had increased its training of snipers during the 1930s. The Imperial Russian Army had no snipers in the First World War, so what German snipers there were on the Eastern Front had easy pickings. The memory of this, plus experience of sniping through involvement in the Spanish Civil War, made the need for snipers in the Red Army seem justified. Ever since the days of Cain and Abel, brother has slain brother in family quarrel. Today, sister joins brother in the business of killing. In the winter of 1939, the Soviet Union invaded Finland with a quarter of a million men. The Finns were outnumbered by 20 to 1. They had few tanks or heavy weapons, but they had excellent rifles and they knew how to fight in the forest. Camouflaged against the snow, Finnish snipers would move silently up on Russian troops, create havoc and ensure a quick getaway on skis. Disorientated by the forest, Russian soldiers found themselves without a clear front, potted at from all directions. Many Finnish snipers were used to hunting eider duck in civilian life. Stalking was in their blood, and the need to minimize damage to the plumage of their prey had made them first-class marksmen. Men like Corporal Simo Hauhe, the master shot of the Finnish 6th Company and best-known sniper in the army, treated hunting for Russians as little different from hunting for ducks. A small farmer with cabinets of trophies for marksmanship, Hauhe's detached, business-like approach cost the Russians more than 500 men. By spring 1940, Finland was crushed by sheer force. But each Finnish life was paid for many times over in Russian lives. The lesson was not lost on the Red Army. Training programs were stepped up and snipers became more widespread throughout the Red Army, being assigned directly to companies and platoons. Tactical training embraced both defensive and offensive employment of snipers. Prime targets for defensive sniping would be officers coordinating an enemy advance.
The Red Army used a broad definition of sniping that included general sharpshooting as well as dedicated sniping with telescopic sights. It took a more consistent line than its western neighbours in integrating sniping and sharpshooting into general military tactics. Stalin himself was involved in the design of the Russian sniper's rifle, the simple but reliable 7.62mm Mosin Nagant M9130, fitted with four-power model PE scope. The M9130 was rugged enough to withstand the Russian winter. Once Operation Barbarossa was underway, many German soldiers would use captured Soviet rifles in preference to their own Mausers. But by the time the Wehrmacht reached Stalingrad in September 1942, the Russians had done their homework. German shelling and bombing had created a city of rubble. A perfect environment for the sniper to come into his or her own. Stalingrad became an urban forest with a hunter behind every ruined doorway. As in the Spanish Civil War, the hunter might be a man, woman, or child. The Wehrmacht had not expected the Russians to stand and fight. The close-range fighting of the Stalingrad streets was a new experience for German troops. the Wehrmacht match the patience and fortitude of the Russian sniper. The constantly shifting front meant that it was easy to become trapped within a particular hideout. Russian snipers often remained in one place for days, sleeping, waking and defecating where they lay. But if there was one quality that meant survival for the snipers at Stalingrad, it was cunning. Unlike the Winter War, this was an arena where the sniper was not so much at liberty to pick off enemy soldiers as engaged in a battle of wits with snipers from the opposing force. stage was set for a duel. Before the war, Vasily Zaitsev had been a hunter in the Urals. He was a man of placid temperament, attentive to detail, with an uncanny ability to stare at an object almost indefinitely without blinking. By the autumn of 1942, he was the crack sniper of the Red Army and had set up a makeshift sniping school of his own in the ruins of the giant Lazur chemical plant. As the success of Russian snipers began to wear down the morale of the Sixth Army, the Wehrmacht learnt of Zaitsev's existence through captured Soviet newspapers. The Red Army newspaper, in our country's defense, published daily figures of Germans killed by snipers. The Wehrmacht's response was to enlist the help of Major Konings, chief instructor of the Zosen Sniper School near Berlin. Konings was sent to Stalingrad with the express purpose of eliminating Zaitsev. But Zaitsev learnt of Konings' presence, and after two of his top snipers were hit by bullets from the same rifle, he knew Konings was no ordinary German sniper. So they began to stalk each other. 
Both knew that their main task lay in locating the other's position. Once one of them could do this, the duel would soon be over. Conning's field craft was second to none. He moved through the ruins like a ghost. But after four days, Zaitsev suspected he had found his lair. Now he had to make Conning's reveal himself. Using a standard Cypher's ploy, Zaitsev waited till he thought the sun was shining in Conning's eyes. Then he demonstrated the crucial advantage a pair of snipers could have over even the most deadly lone operator. At great risk to his life, Zaitsev's partner Kulikov drew Konig's fire and pretended to be hit. Believing he had accomplished his mission, Konings half raised his head to give Zaitsev the target he had been waiting for. In Stalingrad, Russian men and women fought the classic battle of defensive sniping. Zaitsev and the snipers he trained became legends for the part they played in holding the city. Later, as the Red Army steamroller began its thousand-mile drive to Berlin, snipers made their influence felt in an offensive role removing machine gun and mortar crews that could slow down the Russian advance. Armor-piercing bullets were used against lightly armored vehicles and to fire into the vision slits of tanks. But the real influence of the Red Army's successful sniping campaign could be seen in the response of the Wehrmacht. Now it too expanded its training program and dramatically increased the number of snipers it employed. The reputation for consummate sniping the German army had acquired early in the First World War began to be rebuilt. German snipers were trained to produce long-range fire that would show the enemy they were not safe and force them to go to ground. Marksmanship training was meticulous. Great care was taken of telescopic sights. The slightest knock might throw them out. There was experimentation into fitting telescopic sights to semi-automatic weapons, like the 7.92mm Mauser G43. But experienced snipers thought semi-automatic weapons unnecessary and not accurate enough for the skilled marksman and stalker. But experienced snipers preferred the standard 7.92mm 98K fitted with 4 power Zeist ZF.42 sight. Equally great emphasis was placed on the need for excellent concealment and stalking. of camouflage became the subject of extensive investigation. In addition to the standard green and brown sniper's jacket, reversible to white for winter conditions, a seemingly endless variety of camouflage clothing for specific environments was produced. In order to construct effective hideouts, German snipers were issued with folding trenching shovels and with infantry knives with which they could cut foliage. But if there was one thing above all the Wehrmacht had learned from Stalingrad, it was the prime importance of a keen instinct for stalking. As one training film put it, the sniper must strive to acquire the primitive bond with the countryside known to the hunter. 
Meanwhile, long-range accuracy alone was all important in the mountains of North Africa and Southern Europe. With their training focused on getting close to their prey before shooting, the British were at a disadvantage. Sometimes two or three snipers aimed at a single target to increase chances of a hit. United States marksmen, however, came into their own in this environment. The prominent place of the gun in American culture meant good marksmanship was more widespread than in Britain. In addition, such training as United States snipers received consisted mainly of formal target practice on the range. The minimum requirement was to hit a body at 400 yards or a head at 200 yards. Initially, snipers were issued with Springfield A4s, much like the British Enfield, but fitted with a rather poor three-power scope and no backup sights. Nevertheless, American snipers proved their worth in the hills of Tunisia and Italy. But United States sniper training was rudimentary and the importance of field craft was glossed over. Some intensive courses were set up behind the lines, such as the 41st Armored Infantry Regiment's five-week course in Tunisia. But the lack of a coordinated scheme meant that mastery of sniping was uneven throughout the United States Army. And the success of long-range marksmen in the mountains did little to draw attention to the relative neglect of other sniping skills. A neglect that would prove costly after D-Day. Once the Allies had secured the beaches of Normandy in June 1944, they then faced the task of breaking out of their bridgehead Close hedgerows of the Bocage countryside provided perfect cover for German snipers to put into practice the skills they had been honing since Stalingrad. The Allies had walked into a snake pit. They were surrounded by snipers on all sides. United States troops were unprepared for the ability of German snipers to get so close to them without being detected, and to elude capture having got so near. Inexperienced American troops usually made the mistake of hitting the ground and staying put on hearing sniper fire, which only made it easier for the sniper to pick them off one by one. 
British troops were taken unawares by the long range from which German snipers could successfully hit their targets, even when these targets were hiding behind hedges. The British responded by trying to get up to German lines by night. But the Germans responded to this tactic by laying mines along the hedgerows. The Americans and British alike found themselves outclassed by German field craft. Although British training had not neglected this aspect of sniping in the way the United States Army had, first-hand instruction was limited to officers and NCOs who were then expected to pass on what they had learned. The result was an inevitable loss of quality. German snipers now wreaked a degree of havoc behind Allied lines reminiscent of Finnish actions in the Winter War. Some British officers began to disguise themselves as ordinary soldiers to avoid attracting sniper fire. They carried rifles instead of pistols, hid their maps and field glasses, and covered their pips and chevrons. But this only served to make them unrecognizable to their own troops, especially with reinforcements arriving daily. As long as the German line held, Snipers made Allied progress difficult. Once the Allies broke out of their bridgehead in Normandy and their advance began to move more quickly, the snipers' role was diminished. But in September, as the Allied front slowed up towards the Rhine, sniping again became a factor to be reckoned with. Now, the Allied supply line stretched 250 miles back to the beaches of Normandy. Convoys of trucks carrying fuel and ammunition had to brave nerve-wracking journeys to the front through sniper-infested regions christened engine country by American truck drivers. Fear of enemy snipers blended into a general mistrust of snipers as a whole. To the rest of the army, the sniper was a breed apart. Regular infantry on both sides tended to regard even their own snipers with suspicion. One of the routine tasks of the sniper was to gather information on enemy positions to relay back to his unit. But the rest of the unit was subject to a group discipline that seemed not to apply to the sniper. The sniper was a solitary figure in the army, an individual in a team game. He survived mostly by virtue of his own initiative. The sniper had to be alive to everything around him, wary of his every action. The glow from a lighted cigarette might cost him his life if there was an enemy sniper within a few hundred yards. It took a particular steadiness of nerve to remain in position while enemy troops came close enough to be smelled. Nevertheless, there was a sense in which regular troops regarded sniping as unfair. Most soldiers, it was felt, killed indiscriminately and almost by accident, as though it was just an enemy soldier's bad luck to get in the way of fire. The sniper was alone in picking his man and knowing who he was about to kill. The loss of a friend to a sniper's bullet was more of a personal matter than if he had been the victim of automatic fire. The sniper, however, approached his work in a manner devoid of malice towards the people he killed. Many good snipers were men of unusually placid character with a very matter-of-fact attitude to their work. Once a target was located, the kill must be sought swiftly and surely, or not at all. The aim was always for the head, if possible. 
Aiming to wound would be at best an hypocrisy, at worst, potentially fatal. Other than fear, the sniper felt only the adrenaline rush of the hunter whose prey has fallen within his sights. In that moment of inner freezing, the hearing became magnified, the nerves hardened, and there was no qualm of conscience. Or so it should have been. At close range, many cool-headed snipers found their habitual detachment hard to maintain. All the same, there was a job to do. The sniper was unique in not contributing to the appalling civilian casualties that marked World War II off from all previous wars. But to the regular soldier, the sniper often remained a sinister and somewhat dishonest figure. United States troops in particular resented German snipers who would stake out a position from which they could pot Allied soldiers for several days before giving themselves up when their rations ran out and expecting them to be treated like any other prisoner of war. Hitler had already given orders that snipers were not to be taken prisoner. Now a similar sentiment began to prevail among the Allied forces. Privately, General Omar Bradley said he would not take action against any soldier found to have treated a captured sniper roughly. In 1944, the Wehrmacht introduced the special sniper's badge as an incentive to snipers on the Western Front. It came in three grades. Third class for 20 kills, second class for 40 kills, first class for 60 kills. Not surprisingly, the few who earned these badges hardly ever wore them. To be captured wearing a sniper's badge would be to seal one's fate. But there was another arena in which snipers avoided capture at all costs. The world of the jungle. A disorientating maze where shapes deceive and sounds come from all around. A world made for the sniper. Sniping in the jungle was all about concealment. As a matter of course, Japanese sniper training embraced stalking skills, but the real emphasis was placed on the sniper's ability to camouflage his position using natural materials. Snipers were issued with climbing spikes and sometimes tied themselves into a tree for days. The Japanese sniper's ability to endure uncomfortable positions was generally much greater than that of his allied counterpart. Such effective concealment allowed the sniper to wait for allied troops to pass in order to pick them off from behind. The quality of Japanese marksmanship was not high, largely because it did not need to be. In the jungle, most sniping happened at between 100 and 300 yards. The United States' predilection for long-range accuracy was particularly irrelevant in this environment. The 6.5 mm Arisaka Type 97 was underpowered by United States and European standards. But a special reduced charge, together with an unusually long barrel, meant that all the sulphur was burnt by the time a bullet left the gun, eliminating any flash. <laughs> Emitting no flash, and in a world where sounds seem to have no direction, the sniper's shot was untraceable.
But to Western eyes, the Japanese sniper had an additional weapon that threatened to make him invincible. The Army of Japan is a well-trained, sternly disciplined force of fanatics steeled to reckless courage by a primitive moral code which assures to every man who dies in battle an immortal life among the Shinto gods. The Japanese sniper seemed not to fear death. To die in battle was to fall at the moment of perfection. So the Japanese soldier had been told. To allow oneself to be taken prisoner was to bring shame upon one's people. But over time, what had at first seemed a strength began to seem instead a weakness. The stoicism that enabled Japanese snipers to remain in their positions till the very end was matched by a slowness in adapting to new tactics. Allied troops began to improvise various counter-sniping techniques as situations arose. Some United States and Australian patrols sent pairs of counter-snipers up into the trees to stalk and pick off Japanese snipers who often worked alone. The resolute but uncreative Japanese sniper, sometimes tied into position, became a sitting target once spotted. Other ad hoc measures included filling anti-tank guns with grape shot and spraying them into the trees. Gradually, the fact that so many snipers were allowing themselves to be located and killed meant that the general standard of Japanese sniping began to decline. The Japanese approach to sniping stood in stark contrast to conventional wisdom, which held that the sniper, for whom self-preservation was not a primary issue, would not be an effective fighting force. The final test for the Japanese sniper would come on the islands of the Pacific. The Marines who carried out General MacArthur's island hopping campaign towards the Japanese mainland had amongst them a different grade of sniper to the United States troops fighting in Europe. They were issued with the upgraded Springfield A1 equipped with 8-power Unertl scope, the finest sniping rifle of World War II. They had also been through a more thorough training program, including map reading, military sketching, and interpreting aerial photographs that earned them the title of Scout Sniper. Because landing on the beaches of Pacific Islands afforded little opportunity for defensive sniping, Marine scout snipers were often used offensively. On Tarawa, in November 1943, scout snipers were sent together with assault engineers ahead of the main line of attack with the object of eliminating Japanese waterfront defenses. On Saipan and Okinawa, they also led attacks on inaccessible strongholds. But on Tarawa, scout snipers found themselves pinned down on the beaches for hours by better concealed Japanese snipers. Marine sniper training also covered counter sniping techniques. But flushing snipers out at training camp was rather different from the real thing. On the islands, Japanese snipers often dug themselves in below ground, sometimes constructing elaborate trench systems connecting different stakeouts. American counter-sniping techniques were unelaborate by comparison.
Eventually, even Japanese resolve appeared shakable. In dribs and drabs, snipers and regular infantry alike began to give themselves up. By this time, few distinctions had survived the exhaustion of total war. Most often, a sniper was just another dead body. Whether his country knew victory or defeat, the sniper, by 1945, had demonstrated his importance and assured his role in subsequent conflicts. Towards the end of the war, the Wehrmacht had been conducting research into infrared sites. When it came out in February 1945, the first production model, designed for semi-automatic use, had several problems besides being released too late. It too, however, looked forward to later developments. But the sniper remained a paradoxical figure. In himself, the sniper saw both the hunter and the craftsman. The friends of his victims saw a cynical murderer. For the tens of millions of civilians killed by all manner of weapons, from bombs to Cyclone B gas, a sniper's war might have left them alone.